like it's pretty common on this channel that I find great deals on used hardware, but when it comes to new hardware, well, I rarely feel like I'm getting a good value. But, well, this little single board computer might be the outlier. It's got a fairly modern x86 CPU, it has dual NICs, with one of them being a 2.5 gigabit port, it has multiple options for storage, including onboard eMMC, heck, it even has a 40 pin GPIO header. But the best part is that I bought this board for just $63. Now this might sound too good to be true, but at least at the time of filming this, you can go buy it for that price right now. That's not to say there aren't any issues with this little system. Anytime you're spending $63 on a new computer, there are bound to be trade-offs, and well, this definitely has some, but I think this also has some interesting potential, so let's check it out. Okay, so let's start with a little bit of a backstory of how I even stumbled across this little board. I've had the idea for a while now of building a little cluster or kind of a little mini home lab that's separate from my main setup. That way I can do some testing and stuff and well, I'll save the details for a future video. But when trying to figure out what systems I wanted to use for that, I had a few different ideas. Uh, first of all, after watching some of the 10 inch rack stuff like on Jeff Geerling's channel where he had some little Raspberry Pis, I originally thought maybe of doing like a little Raspberry Pi cluster, but well, I kind of wanted to stay away from ARM and stick to x86, that way I'd have a few more options of being able to try out different operating systems systems and such. But when I started looking at x86 single board computers from Latte Panda or Odroid, well I found that those cost a bit more than what I really wanted to spend. Now you might be thinking, well if you're on a budget, why not use some of the tiny mini microsystems like, well, I've covered on this channel. And that's definitely an option, I mean I literally have three HP Elite Desk minis that I covered in a previous video, but while those can be good at drawing very little power when they're at idle, they definitely can ramp up in terms of power draw, and they also need kind of bulky power supplies, and honestly they were probably a little bit overkill for what I was looking to do with my little cluster setup. So I started looking around for different things and I eventually stumbled across these up squared boards from a website called Yuyi2, which I guess they actually make their own single board computers. They've actually reached out a few times for me to cover them and I haven't, but I went on their website just to see what they had and well, I ended up not using their boards, but I came across these listings for these up squared boards. They had a few different options of CPUs and RAM and to my surprise, the cheapest one only cost $63 but that did mean that I was getting a system with only two gigabytes of LPDDR4 memory, which is by far the worst thing about this system, but we'll talk more on that later. Now, obviously I could have spent a bit more and gotten one of the models with a better CPU and four gigabytes of RAM, but at that point, I felt like I was starting to get into the territory of just buying like a Latte Panda or something. And also I just couldn't help but buy a board for $63. Honestly, I was kind of curious about how bad two gigabytes would be. So I, well, I didn't buy one, I bought three of them. This cost me around $188, but then after shipping and import duties, I ended up paying around $235 for all three. Now, if you're like me and you hadn't heard of this before, you might be wondering, what the heck is an upsquared board? Well, Upboard is a manufacturer of single board computers. They started out with just a simple Upboard, which was an x86 version of a kind of a Raspberry Pi-like single board computer. And they've had a few different models of those, but they also created their Upsquared lineup, which is a more square PCB that's larger and has more features. These boards are still kind of made for tinkerers, but they're a little bit more so aimed at like the enterprise and automation spaces. My board is part of the Upsquared 6000 series, which is considered end of life and is probably why I was able to buy it for just $63. The current versions of these feature Intel Alder Lake CPUs that you might be more familiar with, like the N97, but well, this features slightly older CPUs and mine specifically came with an Intel Celeron N6210. This is a true dual core that was released back in 2021, but it's still built on Intel's 10 nanometer process node and has a TDP of only six and a half watts. As I mentioned earlier, this only comes with two gigabytes of LPDDR4 memory, and it also comes with 32 gigabytes of onboard eMMC storage. On the back of the board, you get those two Intel NICs that I mentioned, with one of them being a two and a half gigabit NIC, and then you also get DisplayPort, HDMI, and two USB 3.2 ports. There's also this threaded barrel jack adapter for a 12 volt power supply, as well as this teeny tiny little power button. The board has a lot of options when it comes to expansion and different connectors. One of the first things you'll notice are the three M.2 sockets. On one side, you get an M.2 E key slot, which supports one lane of PCIe Gen 3. And then above that, you also get an M.2 M key slot, which only supports two lanes of PCIe Gen 3. 
On the other side, you get this M.2B key socket, which, well, I'm not entirely sure if this supports PCIe or not. And I say that because, well, I wasn't really able to test this. I, I kind of tried, but I couldn't get anything working. However, in the datasheet, it does have pins for this for PCIe. Now, I should mention one of the awesome things about this board is the documentation. On their website, you can find everything from the datasheet to a user manual, but they also have like various schematics and like 2D drawings with all of the dimensions. And they even have like 3D step files. So if you wanted to like 3D print a custom case for this or something, you can, which, well, I should also mention this doesn't come with the case. So you're going to have to get creative with how you mount it. I was actually kind of fumbling around a bit with this during my testing and eventually used those schematics to build just like a very simple 3D printed stand just to kind of prop this up while I was doing testing. But back to the board, there's also a SATA connector. However, the power connector for that is this odd little two pin connector here, which I don't have a cable for and there isn't one in the box. Obviously there's that 40 pin GPIO header that I mentioned. And well, I don't really deal with a whole lot of like makery Raspberry Pi stuff, but I believe this is very similar to the pinout of the Raspberry Pi GPIO. I think all of the pins don't necessarily support all of the same protocols and such, but I think this actually might be compatible with some hats. I think your luck might vary, but it is there if you're wanting to use this for like automation and such. Like I said, this was actually sort of one of the purposes of this board. Oh, and I don't know if I mentioned this yet, but well, it's pretty obviously just passively cooled with this big heat sink on the bottom or top, depending on how you want to look at it. All right, so this board's a little odd. Why would I actually want it? Well, mostly because I got it for $63. If I was buying this for the original like asking price of over $200, I think there's no way I would be interested. But if I can buy three of them for that price, well, now we're talking. Normally I wouldn't be that interested in a board like this because I don't do a whole lot of like the makery stuff, but well, it does have a fairly modern CPU. It has got dual NICs. So there's some cool stuff you could do with this. I think right off the bat, one of the first things I thought of was just setting up a very simple low powered router. I'm assuming this board's not gonna draw a lot of power. It has dual NICs, one of them's two and a half gigs. So like if you don't have layer three switching and you wanna be able to route between different VLANs at two and a half gig, you could set up this two and a half gig port as your LAN and there you go, you have two and a half gig routing. You could also set this up as a lightweight little server running something like Home Assistant or other simple tasks. Or if you're like me and you're interested in building a little cluster, having some small passively cool low power systems that you can get for pretty cheap that also have like dual networking and different storage options, that could be pretty handy. But well, let's actually check this thing out and see if it's worth the $63 I spent on it. Now I should mention, similarly to how it doesn't include a little SATA adapter, this also doesn't include a power adapter in the box. Literally the only thing in the box is this board. So you will have to bring your own 12 volt power supply. Fortunately, it just uses a very standard 5.5 by 2.5 millimeter DC barrel jack. After getting it plugged in and powered on, well, I was initially a little bit scared because I ran into this password for the BIOS. However, I just hit enter and that worked. The BIOS was pretty simple. There wasn't much to talk about. However, there were a lot of options for the GPIO stuff that, like I said, I'm not really gonna get into. I started things off by just installing Debian 13 and rather than installing it to an NVMe SSD or anything, I just installed it straight to the eMMC storage, which worked just fine. Once I had an OS installed, the first thing I wanted to check out was just how low powered this thing was. So I made sure the HDMI cable was unplugged and then I ran PowerTop Autotune as well as this auto ASPM script. And well, after running all of that, the power draw only dropped to around 6.8 watts, which is very low to be clear. But I was kind of hoping with a system like this that the power draw would be even lower. But well, as I've said many times on this channel, when it comes to idle power draw, it's not just the CPU that's drawing power. You have your memory and you have storage and you have your network interfaces and then all of the other various things that are on the motherboard, which, well, that got me thinking. This thing has the GPIO and all of the different serial connections and everything else that I saw in the BIOS. And well, maybe that was what was drawing some power. So I went in the BIOS, I disabled everything I could find. And well, the power draw was still exactly the same at 6.8 Watts, which like I said, is not bad. I was hoping it might be a little bit lower, but that's pretty darn low still. And the good news was when I actually ran a stress test on this, the power draw only jumped up to like nine watts. In fact, I think the highest power draw this thing ever hit was like 12 watts. And that was when I was hitting the CPU and the GPU pretty hard. So while the idle power draw might not be crazy low, it is good to know that even if this thing's running at like 100%, it's not gonna be drawing more than like 10 watts probably if you're not using the GPU. In fact, one of the benefits of knowing that this isn't going to draw a ton of power is that you can actually run this over PoE. 
well, sort of. It's not like a built-in feature or anything, but because you know that this thing's never going to really draw a ton even under load, you can use a simple adapter like this one to power it over PoE, and yeah, sure enough, even with a cheap little PoE switch, it worked just fine. Now, part of the reason this thing doesn't draw a ton of power is because it does have a dual-core Celeron that is not that powerful. I ran Geekbench 6, and well, you can see here we're getting scores that are about half that of the Raspberry Pi 5. It's actually kind of funny because I looked up the prices of a Raspberry Pi 5 2 gigabyte model. And once you factor in the cost of like a micro SD card and the power supplies for both and everything, uh, they're pretty much the same price as what I paid for this. So if you don't mind running ARM, that's probably a much better deal. Performance wasn't that great, but it was still better than some other low-powered older systems that I've checked out that managed to do plenty of things just fine. So this could still be capable of running some lightweight tasks, and realistically I had a feeling that the 2 gigabytes of RAM was going to be the bigger issue. To test that out, I started off by installing Home Assistant OS, which actually worked just fine. I wasn't concerned about the CPU or anything with the system, but I was a little bit concerned about how 2 gigabytes of RAM would work out, but as it turns out, we were only really using like a third of our memory. And sure, this was just running a very simple config that I imported that I kind of used for testing, but I decided to look at my actual Home Assistant instance, which is running in a container, and that was only using like 500 megabytes. So realistically, I think for a pretty common standard Home Assistant setup, this thing would work just fine. But like I said, you could also do that just fine with something like a Raspberry Pi. But this guy has something that a Raspberry Pi or a lot of other single board computers don't, which is not only dual network interfaces, but a two and a half gig interface as well. So you could install something like OpenSense or OpenWRT and set up a DIY router. Now I wasn't concerned about running OpenWRT on this little guy because, well, OpenWRT could probably run on a literal potato. So I decided to try installing OpenSense. I did look up the minimum system requirements and it showed that it only required two gigabytes of RAM. So I thought we'd be okay. However, I did end up getting a warning that I needed 3000 megabytes to copy over the system image, but I just proceeded and it worked just fine. However, I should note that I installed this using UFS, not ZFS, as I figured ZFS would probably require a bit more RAM. After getting it installed, I hooked up my laptop to the LAN interface, and sure enough, everything seemed to be working just fine. The RAM usage was actually quite a bit lower than I expected, and I never saw the CPU usage go up more than like 70% or so. Without putting together a crazy test setup with a 2.5 gig switch and VLANs and multiple devices, I couldn't really test the 2.5 gig throughput, but I was able to at least test on an open speed test server that's upstream of the router, and it seemed like the gigabit throughput was just fine. So like I said, if you don't need like one of those little four ports firewall appliances you can get on AliExpress and such, you just need a simple little two port router, but you want to buy something new that's low powered, this thing might do a pretty decent job. Now one thing I test pretty commonly on hardware is running Proxmox because, well, that's just my hypervisor of choice. But I wasn't really all that hopeful that I would have a good experience here. Uh, first of all, I did try installing it on the eMMC, but as I expected, that didn't work. So I had to drop in an NVMe SSD. Now the minimum system requirement for Proxmox does show two gigabytes of memory, but that's the two gigabytes that you need to actually run Proxmox. That doesn't include the memory you would need to run stuff on top of Proxmox. And once I got it installed, you can see that I was using 70% of my memory just sitting idle running Proxmox. So VMs were clearly out of the question here, but I was curious if I could run a few LXC containers on that last little bit of RAM that I had. I cautiously created a couple of simple Linux containers just to see if the system would crash or anything, and that seemed to go just fine. So I went ahead and installed a third LXE container where I actually ran WireGuard and the WireGuard dashboard, which I thought might be like an actual decent way to use this as sort of like a little edge, uh, you know, VPN server of sorts. And uh, well, that seemed to work okay as well. I was actually kind of curious and went and looked at my Proxmox server to see how much RAM my various LXC containers were using. And it varies a lot from like multiple gigabytes to like, you know, 10 megabytes or so. So technically, I guess you could have run Proxmox on this as long as you're only running some very lightweight LXC containers and services. And realistically, even then over time, you're probably gonna run into RAM issues. So it's probably a lot smarter to just run something like Debian or maybe even like Ubuntu server and then just run Docker on top of that. Now, I was a little bit bummed that I had to use that NVMe SSD for Proxmox because, well, it would be nice to have that M.2 socket for maybe some other adapter, like if you wanted to use a two and a half gig NIC or something. And normally I would leverage like the E key slot for different adapters like that, but well, it's in this really awkward spot where it's underneath the M key slot. So realistically, if you tried to install like a bigger adapter there, you wouldn't be able to put an NVMe SSD on top of it. 
I did find though that if I use this very specific E key to M key adapter, which sort of reverses the orientation, I could just barely squeeze in an NVMe 2230 SSD. However, I couldn't even screw it in and had to just rely on another NVMe SSD on top of it, sort of sandwiching it in place. And sure enough, this actually worked. However, long-term, I don't imagine thermals would be great having two of those NVMe SSDs literally just touching each other. I did kind of experiment with putting a little thermal pad between them, which it did bend the top SSD a little bit. But my thought is that if you put a heat sink on the top SSD and then put a little uh, thermal pad between them, you might be able to sort of draw some of the heat from the bottom SSD into the body of the other SSD. And then that one has a heat sink. So maybe it would sort of even out, but yeah, it's a, it's a bit of an odd setup. The other option for storage that might make more sense is that SATA port. But as I said, it uses this odd little two pin connector for power. And I didn't have any cables or connectors that I could use to make that work. What I did have though, was this little USB adapter for SATA power. However, that is designed to work with an eSATA connection. So I also had to use another adapter from eSATA to SATA. And well, it wouldn't be a hardware haven video without a weird mess of adapters, but yeah, sure enough, that works just fine. So I guess you could use USB power or you could try to crimp a little connector if you found it to uh, make your own little power connector there. I guess you might be able to just buy one. I didn't actually think to look on their store if they sell them. So I will figure that out in the edit. When I was digging through my little bin of USB installers, I happened to stumble across Chrome OS Flex, which I hadn't used in a while. I decided to give this a shot, and while well, basic web browsing wasn't terrible, and I was able to at least watch some YouTube videos at 1080p 30, but anything beyond that led to dropped frames. I wasn't expecting this to work that well as a desktop or anything with just the two gigabytes of RAM, but what I thought it might handle decently well was operating as a true thin client or a streaming PC. I installed Ubuntu to try to keep RAM usage as low as possible, and then installed Moonlight to stream from my gaming PC. And the experience here was great. Most of the latency was actually due to the encoding time on the server side. Everything was buttery smooth, regardless of whether I was trying to get some work done on a 4K monitor or just playing a bit of Halo. So in conclusion, this system, well, it's, it's kind of weird. It's not great at anything. Uh, it, I mean, outside of like a very low powered, simple, cheap DIY firewall, uh, there's not a whole lot that it does better than something else. If you're looking for like a simple little lightweight server to run like Home Assistant or something like that, uh, there's cheaper new options and definitely cheaper like old used options as well. It's a little awkward because it doesn't come with a case or a power supply or anything. So you're, you're going to have to like 3D print a case or, or something for this, unless you just want to kind of leave it sitting on the heatsink like that or whatever. The two gigabytes of RAM is definitely an issue and will definitely limit what you can do with this. But well, I guess for the right use case and the right price, which for me was 63 bucks. So yeah, not too bad. This could be a very interesting little system. They are end of life, so keep that in mind. That's why they're probably so cheap. But yeah, if you're able to pick one of these up and it kind of fits your needs, it's kind of a cool little quirky system. I don't typically cover new hardware and I definitely don't cover single board computers a lot. So this is kind of a fun, different look at something interesting. And uh, I'm still planning on making a little kind of 3D printed 10 inch rack cluster out of these. So stay tuned for that. Oh yeah, you also probably noticed that this video didn't have any advertisements in it. And that's thanks to my amazing raid members. If you're not a raid member, which, well, yeah, I know you're not a raid member because if you were a raid member, you wouldn't be seeing this right now. Just like how you wouldn't be seeing any ads in any of my videos because for as little as a dollar a month, you can get early access to all my videos and not see any ads, which I think is a pretty good deal. So maybe consider checking that out. There's also some higher tiers that have some more perks and also just help support what I do a bit more. So maybe check those out as well. Not only does it give you some perks, it also helps support this channel and helps pay for me to make these videos and not be quite so reliant on ads. Maybe consider signing up for as little as a dollar a month. That's the end of my spiel. It's also the end of this video. So thank you guys so much for watching. Stay curious and I can't wait to see you in the next one.